Linda believes that this shaft was created by removing loose volcanic rocks from the ground. The resulting serpentine tunnel heads down for 300 feet. Tight squeeze, humid, and uh, I can definitely feel the sensation of going down, down into the center of the pyramid. Over the centuries, this tunnel has been looted many times. All that's left of the original interior are a few stone channels that collected the water dripping from the ceiling. A hidden tunnel or chamber would be a real prize for the archaeologists. It could hold secret treasures that offer clues to some of this city's riddles. It's getting hard to breathe. To penetrate the hidden secrets of the pyramid, scientists are using the latest technological tool. Got something huge and white in the center of the... Oh yes, this is a muon detector. It's an instrument uh, that we are using to see if, if, if there are chambers that the archaeologists have not seen inside the pyramid. A muon detector. Muon detector, yes. Wow. The muon detector is like a huge x-ray machine. It tracks muons, subatomic particles. Just like dental x-rays find cavities in teeth, the muon detector finds cavities in the pyramid above. Most muons get absorbed by the mass of the pyramid and don't reach the detector. But in spots where there are holes or chambers, more muons pass through to the machine where they're recorded and mapped. As for the tunnel, this is where it ends, in four chambers, which Linda says may have represented the four quadrants of the city above. Who knows what clues may have been in these chambers before it was looted? The muon detector will hopefully help improve our knowledge. But it'll take at least another year to measure the muons and work out if there are any hidden chambers. So until then... We'll just let it do its thing. <laughs> Up next, I travel to an ancient volcanic glass mine in search of more clues to this mysterious civilization. Oh, because it might collapse? It might collapse. Oh. In search of clues about the inhabitants of the City of the Gods, I found out about mass sacrifices and possible hidden chambers under the state temple. Okay. From above, I saw real evidence that this was a true metropolis. It was a city with a multi-ethnic population, ruled by a mysterious elite. How did this city become so grand? What was it that propelled it to greatness? You're gonna need this. Okay. And we have a flashlight, okay. so let's go. All right. I'll grab I'm my shovel. I'm here with Ken Hurth, an anthropologist like and plan. expert on Mesoamerican commerce. He tells me that the source of their power wasn't gold or diamonds. It was a substance called obsidian volcanic glass. It's hard to imagine that this was the great wealth that propelled the rise of Teotihuacan. So Ken's going to show me what this material was all about and why this versatile stone was the steel of Mesoamerica. Yeah, be careful going down. It's been raining a lot, so it'll be slippery. Ken's taking me to an area where obsidian has been mined since the days of Teotihuacan. Now we're going in, so be careful. It's been raining a lot, and we don't want to have roof collapse. Okay, yeah. That would not be good. This ancient mine was converted into a modern shaft, and it's still mined today. Ken explains that the roof is completely unsupported. Recent rains have soaked the ground and weakened the walls. Just two days ago, a tunnel collapsed. And that's not something we want to happen while we're inside. Hopefully, the miner's prayer candle will offer us some protection. The miners dig until they find a vein of obsidian, and then they'll follow the vein, uh, taking out the nodules that they can, uh, they can find. Be careful, it's really tight here. I like it that way. Ken and I are now a long way in. Yeah, we can no longer idea. see the mouth of the tunnel. But we've asked some of the miners to wait near the entrance, just in case something happens. Yeah. Josh, here's a good spot. All right. 
Oh wow, look at that. Yeah, you can you can see the natural obsidians embedded in a, uh, a soil ash matrix. Wow, there's obsidian everywhere. Look at this. So this was gold, but to them obsidian. This was, this was the valuable stuff, yeah. Right. So let's just yeah. uh, see if we can find a good quality piece. Uh -huh. Can we take a piece from like up here? Would that be unwise? Uh, we could, but uh, the roof might collapse. We're better <laughs> off. Looking. Okay, yeah, uh, let's uh, focus on the floor. Yeah, I'll fo focus on the floor. Okay. And what is it that we're looking for? What makes one piece of obsidian better than another? Well, the quality of the glass. No inclusions or veins, because mm -hmm. that makes it easier to flake. Uh, and that's what the people at Teotihuacan would have been looking for. Might be good. This one here? That one is very good. Yeah? Let's just test it and see what quality glass it is. How do you test it? Uh, I've got a little hammer stone. If we just... Uh, Knock off a couple flakes. Mm -hmm. Oh boy, that is good quality glass. All right, that one's mine. Okay. This may be another good quality piece here. Okay. Yeah, it looks like pretty good glass. So I've got one. I'll take this one. Ken says that there's something Back special the about this obsidian, but we need to get a good look at it in the light. Outside the mine, uh, there's quality, a debris area green. where miners have left their rejects. The pieces you'll see that what makes this obsidian But unique, even the rejects carry uh, the hallmark in, of what makes so this, this obsidian unique. You'll see that it uh, has a green golden sheen to it, wow, look at that. which uh, was important to pre-Hispanic people. They thought green stone was alive, and so it had a symbolic importance. Uh, whether it was a green obsidian or jade, it was uh, symbolically important to them. This green uh, quality obsidian you won't find in any other obsidian in Mexico or anywhere in the New World. It only occurs here. So if anyone had a green obsidian blade, it came from here. It came from here. See the, uh, All right. the old shafts. Let's go in. One of the secrets to Teotihuacan's success was their control of this source of rare green obsidian. But the city was also surrounded by two other huge obsidian deposits and several small ones. The raw materials and tools found in various stages of production at Teo show that every aspect of obsidian manufacture was controlled by the city. Well, let's just, Ken uh, and I head to a nearby to campsite and, and where he and other archaeologists do their field work. He wants to show me how to shape obsidian into the tools of the era and demonstrate the unusual qualities of this stone. What we want to shape is uh, something like this. It's called a macro core, mm -hmm. and it's uh, made by percussion flaking mm -hmm. and has a, a flat platform that we take our flakes off of. Okay. What we'd like to produce are nice parallel sided uh, ridges. This is what we want to create. And this is what we're starting. That's what we're starting with. Okay. Right. Show me how. Okay. Hammerstone. Hammerstone in hands. <laughs> tricky, tricky, tricky. Yeah. Creating a core is standard flint napping procedure, but napping obsidian okay, is tricky. So can I just come in hard and heavy right here and, <laughs> and see Pro if I can Probably it? not. It flakes off very easily. If you're not careful, huge chunks would break off, and you'd be left with a lot of useless bits. And I don't want that. Yeah. That's good. Good? That's a good one. Yeah, just like that, all the way around. To learn flint napping, you gotta break a lot of rock. Once they have a percussion core like this, they use these ridges to start making blades. Okay. This, is a, this is a Teotihuacan finished core, mm -hmm. and what you can see are all the parallel ridges are the uh, spots where uh, blades came off. Mm -hmm. Looks like this. So, so one of the things that the Teotihuacan of flint nappers were making with long skinny blades like this. Long skinny blades. Mm -hmm. They would have basically... The Teotihuacanos would have braced themselves between trees or stumps. But Ken has created this portable rig. Holding the core with his feet, he has to apply just the right amount of pressure. It takes skill and precision. Something that Ken has developed over many, many hours of hard practice. Good one. Nice. Oh, that's great. This core ah. is a blade factory. You can flake off blade after blade from it. Okay. You can see where they came off the core. And that's wow. just what the Teotihuacanos did. That's great. And we know that they made these, right? Right. These right. replicate exactly what archaeologists have found. Exactly. Yep. 
Archaeologists have found Teotihuacan green obsidian tools all over Mesoamerica, in sites thousands of miles away. This obsidian trade was key in making Teotihuacan the economic center of Mesoamerica. Traders and craftsmen carried these cores to distant towns and flaked off blades on the spot for their customers. The city not only controlled the export of obsidian, it also controlled the human skill it took to shape it. And that skill was vital. The, they were a Stone Age society, they didn't have metal. Uh, they manufactured all their cutting edge from obsidian, which is the sharpest cutting edge you know, that you can manufacture, uh, even sharper than surgical stainless steel. Sharpest edge you can manufacture even today? Even today. <laughs> That's so cool. I want to explain what's going on here. Some of the local miners have actually brought in a goat, which they're going to prepare for dinner. But I want to make a point using obsidian. The reason why obsidian blades were found all over Mesoamerica is because everyone had to eat and everyone needed a knife. Obsidian was the most important tool when it came to processing. This is what puts the meat on the table. They would use the obsidian blades for, for weaponry and, and then also they used it for ceremonial activities. They would let their own blood to give it to the gods. And so a small lancelet, they could pierce their tongue or their ears and draw blood and, and uh, then offer it as an offering to the gods. Blood was sacred. Wow. So this is practical, ceremonial, and sacred. Why not let these guys come in and take their goat back? Gracias! Teotihuacan's control of this versatile substance made them an economic powerhouse. Their sphere of influence extended well beyond their borders. Coming up, I decode the city's frescoes and play one of the oldest sports in the world to solve the mystery of the city of the gods. I'm trying to piece together the story of Teotihuacan. I've seen a master-planned metropolis and evidence of mass human sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Now I've oh, discovered boy, that, that a unique cool. Stone Age technology was the source of its power. Obsidian made Teotihuacan the dominant culture in the region. But how did this concentration of wealth and authority impact its citizens? To find out, we have to go to an apartment complex on the site. Some 300 years after Teo was established, city planners shifted the emphasis from the construction of monumental architecture to the construction of more than 2,000 residential compounds in the city. I'm back with Mike Spence, and he tells me that in its prime, around 450 AD, close to 150,000 people lived in Teotihuacan. That's a residence. People would have been eating and sleeping and living in here. To accommodate them, these apartments were designed and built on a scale unprecedented in history. This is absolutely unique. Mesoamerica hasn't seen anything like this before, and this wasn't practiced anyplace else in Mesoamerica at this time. Is there any way to know if, like, if this was a major switch for the living lifestyles of these people? I suspect the state had to use a little bit of muscle to get people into these. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see it is sort of state design. There's commonalities in all of them that suggest that. So here, this is, this is a residence? That's a residence. By forcefully relocating the people into government housing, the ruling elite tightened their grip on daily life. But the social engineering didn't stop there. Political indoctrination was incorporated into the decor of every home. And that is my next clue. Teotihuacan may have had a written language, but scholars haven't been able to decipher it yet. So another way we can learn about this society is by studying the art and artifacts they've left behind. I'm now heading to an apartment complex here on the site to meet an art historian, and I'm hoping she can tell me more about this civilization. Her name is Kim so Goldsmith. This room, this room She's been studying the mural art in Teotihuacan yours. for more than 15 years. She says that the artwork is as well-planned as the architecture of the city. It sure did, we stop at a recurring really icon, fabulous. an image of a priest. Aren't these fabulous? So what can these tell us about the people of Teotihuacan? Well, we could learn a lot more if we had more. We probably have about 1.1% of their mural artwork remaining. But in general, the mural paintings of Teotihuacan are really representing state symbols.